Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we continue after the short break, and I'm very proud to announce our next speaker, Mr. Steve Malhern, who's been working 25 years in network security or something I, like that. I am not old yet. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's, it's very difficult to understand that network specialty was taught in, in the schools, in the elementary schools. So. Anyway, uh, so uh, the title of, of his presentation is The Rise and Fall of the DDoS Attacks in 2012. And I'm very curious about it. So, Steve, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, firstly, Hello everybody, um, I know it's Friday afternoon, everybody's probably a little bit tired, so I'll, I'll try and keep you awake as much as I can. Um, so upon request of, of the organisers, um, we've changed the format of, uh, of what I'm going to talk about a little bit today. Um, what's actually been requested is a more technical detail on mitigation of DDoS and how it is mitigated. Um, I'm going to break it up a little bit. Into and separate it into service providers and enterprise. And the reason why I do that is there are actually two very different problems that are trying to be solved there. Historically, I mean, I work for Fortinet now, but historically I work for a company called Arbor Networks. If anybody knows of Arbor, they're pretty much the market leader in the service providers in mitigating DDoS today. So almost every tier one service provider in the world today has Arbor as a solution. And there's reasons for that, and I'll talk about it. And the problem that Arbor was solving when I first started in DDoS over, well, 10 years ago, um, was a very different problem to what we're now solving today. And it's important to understand that. DDoS has actually changed quite dramatically. Um, the one very good reason it's changed is because the service providers have put in mitigation. So as soon as you put in a protection, people are going to try and work around it. But I'll talk around that as well. Anyway, the, the first slide, I, I mean, everybody knows what's happening in the press. Everybody knows what's going on. This is just a number of um, press snips that I pulled from the past two weeks, just to give you an idea. And um, if we look at them, you know, we, we have a saying in England, and I don't know whether it translates very well, of the sky's falling in, you know, everything's going wrong. It's not actually as bad as people think. Um, and believe it or not, a lot of the press and the way they focus on DDoS today is about one thing and one thing only, and that's the size of a DDoS attack. They have a challenge when they're trying to communicate to people about what DDoS is and how severe it is. Because the majority of lay people and normal people out there don't understand the technicality. So the only way that they can really talk about DDoS is in a size perspective. How big is the DDoS attack? Because that's, that's all they've got to measure. However, if you look at the products out there that mitigate DDoS and the products out there that stop DDoS today, or attempt to stop it as much as they can, um, they actually won't focus on the size of the attack, or the majority of products won't, and there's a reason for that. And I'll talk about that as well. Anyway, so if we look at how uh, DDoS attacks have migrated, how they've changed, everybody knows that the first DDoS attacks were essentially spoofed. Um, then we had non-spoof botnets because people were validating if the host was actually there or not. If it was a spoofed host, then it ignored it and uh, tried to block that traffic. And then we came up, and this is more recent, and this is what we see happening more and more, is what we call bot servers. And it's just basically, it's more horsepower to generate more traffic to throw at a single destination or a group of destinations to, to uh, enforce some form of de de denial of service. Um, you actually have to look at, is this the biggest threat that the majority of people are actually seeing from DDoS today? And the feedback we have is, no, it's not. And the reason why is all of these are what we call brute force or volumetric attacks. You know, it's just as much as they can possibly to throw it. Thank you. Did that work? It? Oh, sorry. Um, so, so they're just throwing as much data as they possibly can 
at it. Now, if you, and this is where I'll start to talk about service providers. If you actually look at a service provider's problem, it's actually very different to an enterprise problem. When I first started uh, you know, proposing and sp specifying DDoS mitigation solutions, as I say, about 10 years ago, what was the service provider's major problem? The major problem was not the customer or protecting the customer. The major problem or challenge they had was actually protecting their infrastructure. And that's important to understand because virtually every DDoS solution that a service provider has today is not focused on protecting his customers. It's actually focused on protecting his own infrastructure. And I'll talk about the reasons for that. Anyway, um, this is just a couple of quotes. I, I highlight the red bits because it's lots of words and nobody really wants to read lots. Um, traditional measures are ineffective against today's DDoS solutions. So this is, this is the Financial Services Information Sharing and Analysis Center, Fizzy Isaac as we refer to them. Um, and what they're actually saying is the majority of solutions that are actually out there today are not adequate. Or the majority of people or enterprises out there today actually don't have enough DDoS protection. What they're trying to do is they're either trying to do it as cheaply as possible, as cost effective as possible, or alternatively, they're not focusing on the right parts. And there's, there's a few reasons for that that we'll talk about. Um, and members should maintain a heightened level. That was, that was only last week, so or a couple of weeks ago. And that was obviously the, the recent DDoS attacks that have happened both in Sweden and the US. Uh, whoever is to blame, I don't know, but, um, but obviously somebody is. Anyway. So, um, conflicting reports on size of attacks. Um, this is a report that comes out from a, a, a group. It's a, a, a company, Prolexic. I don't know whether you know them, but they actually provide a DDoS service in the internet, in the cloud. And what they actually do is redirect traffic to their cleaning center when an attack is ongoing. And they've quoted that they've sustained peak, peaking attacks at about 70 gig, and they're saying 30 million packets per second. Um, the reason why they quote those values and the reason why they focus on those values is very simple. They actually use solutions like Arbor. And Arbor is very much focused on brute force volumetric attacks and how to resolve them. Now, out there today, you'll also see a number of other reports. So for the, fir for the first time ever, in 2010 to 2011, and it is historical, the maximum size of a DDoS attack dropped. So everybody thinks, oh, is DDoS going away? Now, of course, it isn't going away. It's changing. Yeah. It's transforming. So um, this is from Akamai, another group, uh, prim primarily providing caching systems and content delivery networks. And they will quote these as the top countries in the world as source of DDoS attacks. Uh, that's their view. I'll give you another view from Kaspersky, a view in August 2011. That was the source of DDoS attacks. February 2012, that was the other source of DDoS attacks. They bear zero or very little relevance to each other. Now, to me, that gives me a very clear message. Either they're getting it wrong or it's changing quite dramatically. Now, I actually opt for the second one. I think it is changing, and it's changing quite in a speed that the majority of enterprises and organizations struggle to keep up with. Because very often, you know, a procurement process or a purchasing process that a company undertakes can take months. Now, what they're actually doing is trying to fix a problem. When they come to deliver a solution, the problem's changed. That's a problem for them. And hence why we say rise and fall of DDoS. DDoS levels aren't just going up, they are actually dropping as well. And it, it, as I say, it, it's changing. It's changing a lot. So, recent quote from WikiLeaks. I find this quite amusing, only because WikiLeaks are normally the bad guys, but on this time, you know, they're the victims and not the instigators. Um, the DDoS not, was not just simple bulk UDP ICMP. It wasn't just throwing traffic at it. Uh, and most hardware filters wouldn't work. We'll talk about different ways of mitigating DDoS and the way the majority of organizations, basically service providers and enterprise, how they will mitigate DDoS attacks. 
I have this reference. I call it sizes and everything. And again, it's focusing. So this is a recent report. I won't, I won't quote who reported it, but it's uh, more than 75% of attacks were less than one gig. One gig is not a huge amount of data today. It's not a huge number of hosts. But they were effective, they were detected, and they caused problems for the enterprises involved. That's actually a huge number of DDoS attacks. The other one, everybody talks about, and again, the press. The press will dramatize, they'll blow up, they'll say, you know, it's all about blackmail. Everybody's trying to gain money or gain revenue off this. Less than 5% of all DDoS attacks that were analyzed in this report were for any financial extortion whatsoever. A lot of the time, it's just somebody is upset. <laughs> Somebody's upset somebody else. And so they say, right, OK, we're going to DDoS them. And in fact, the challenge that you now have, and one of our customers actually um, spoke to him a few weeks ago. I think he was offered 30,000 no, botnet for something like $3 an hour. Ridiculous, you know. That will generate quite substantial amounts of traffic. How effective it will be is questionable, but that's what people are quoting, and that's what people are offering for various different reasons. Anyway, so admitting there's a problem isn't defeat. Another report, it's all about cost. And the two points I pull up here, very, very simple. 80% of financial services suppliers put the cost at more than $10,000 an hour. The interesting bit as well, more than 10%, it's more than $100,000 an hour. You can, get, you can guess or assume they're the online traders. They're the guys that the whole business revolves around internet and internet access. And then if we look down, mitigation methods. And again, I'll talk about this in a lot more detail. Um, over two-thirds of the companies surveyed were using basically inept technology. What they were trying to do was adapt existing solutions that they had in place today, either for delivery of content or for protection of their network, and they were then trying to use that to protect against DDoS. I have my own views on how effective it is, but, but we'll start talking about dedicated DDoS solutions and how they work and why they're more successful in a, in a few minutes. Um, interesting, a quarter didn't have any protection at all. That doesn't surprise me. Um, and less than 5% have purchased any hardware. Yeah, yeah. Um, everybody talks about statements in networking. I mean, I've worked for vendors for a long time, and they come up with some good statements, some not so good statements. You know, you can't protect what you can't measure is the ultimate. If you can't see it, how are you expected to either be able to react to it or protect against it? If you've got no protection in place whatsoever, well, you won't even know whether there's DDoS attacks occurring. That's the worry, apart from a customer ringing you up and saying, I either can't get through to the website or I've got poor connectivity or poor performance. So, um, building the defense. Uh, every time we come up with a form of DDoS defense, I can guarantee there's another tool in the waiting, just waiting to be released on the internet. Um, the challenge that you have with that, and an awful lot of the solutions today will quote that they're signature based. You know, everybody knows, well, firewall vendors, sorry, virus, virus vendors, antivirus vendors are going to be in business forever and a day. Why? Because everybody's going to still come out with new viruses. From our perspective, and I'll start talking about layer seven, layer seven DDoS attacks, how they focus, how they attack, uh, what they do. Essentially, they home in on the majority of occasions a vulnerability. And it's either a vulnerability in the host itself or a vulnerability in the operating system. And those vulnerabilities will continue, whether we like it or not. You know, whether we're in the business of instigating an, an attack or protecting against an attack, those vulnerabilities will be in place. I once went to a presentation, um, and it was just after Slammer had hit. I don't know whether any of you remember it. I'm old enough to. And Slammer had hit, and it was obviously a vulnerability in, it, in SQL, and it caused massive outages for a lot of companies and a lot of networks around the world. And the guy from Microsoft, uh, who was the marketing, the European marketing director, 
who went up to do this presentation. And literally the press were baying for his blood. They wanted to ask him all the most difficult questions in the world. And he killed it all. He stood up and he said, before anybody asks anything, we're all human. We make mistakes. Anybody that's been a coder or been a programmer will know, you know I, I, I started out as that. We make mistakes. That's the challenge that we've got. These opportunities for DDoS attacks will continue to arise. The challenge that we have is how do we scale solutions and DDoS mitigation to be able to protect. So let's look at a service provider dilemma. I'll give you the two examples. It, I think it's, it's good to, for you to see it. He's got a problem, a service provider. Do I protect my network, my revenue, or my customers? And how can I try and protect them all? Because that's the goal. But I've got to prioritize. Now, a service provider, let's look at what they're measured on. They're actually measured on the success criteria is network uptime, not on customer satisfaction. Every SLA that you ever sign with a service provider is network uptime, because that's what they can commit to. Look at build for DDoS attacks. I'll never forget going to a service provider and saying, we do a great DDoS solution. And he sa I said, you know, have you thought about offering it to your customers? And I won't name the service provider, but he turned around and said, why? Why should I? They, I, I charge them for that data. <laughs> he said, at the end of the day, they're using my network more. Just because it's bad traffic, that's not my problem. And that was his view. Admittedly, two years later, when, it, when other service providers did have a DDoS solution, he came back and said, well, maybe I'm interested now. But that was, that was a different story. Anyway, um, increased use of the network. Network stability. Service providers, I've worked with service providers for over 10 years. They hate change in a network. Why do they hate change in a network? Because it brings instability into a network, something they, they're measured on. And they have strict change management processes. All of that makes them struggle to provide, actually, a good DDoS solution because DDoS attacks come and go. They're not static, they're not constant, and they have varying different levels, varying different sources and destinations. That actually causes a problem for a service provider. Let's take the other example from an enterprise or internet data or hosting center. What's his issues? He's got to maintain service. That's what he's measured on. He has lots of changing services. It changes quite dynamically. So does his priorities, his network does. And he has to mitigate as quickly as possible. He can't afford any downtime. Forget the hour-long downtime. And you'll hear, and I think I quote it in here. Um, I call it human latency. It's the time it takes for somebody to have a trigger and then have to react to protect a network or protect a service. That in a service provider is typically hours. It's not minutes. For an enterprise... That's unacceptable. And often what you find, it's the enterprise that contacts the service provider and says, I'm under attack. Can you do something about it? But that, to them, is, is an unacceptable position for them to be in. Anyway, moving on. So the both goals have the, 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 the attempt to stop the attack, but they actually have very different problems. And that's why I separate them both. So the Arbor Network's type of solution today, how does it work? Okay, so it typically uses flow, NetFlow, CFlow D, whatever you want, but it's sampled data, often up to 1,000 to 1. What that gives them is scalability. So they're able to monitor large networks, large amounts of data, and be able to scale. What it doesn't give them is granularity. So if you have individual hosts that are critical to an enterprise, he can't identify them to a service provider. And that's his worst fear. Because he is geared around DDoS in a volumetric manner. He monitors amount of data. How does he do it? Well, he does it through baselining. And even, even enterprise solutions do this as well. What is baselining? Baselining is measuring data minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day, week by week, and building a pattern of what those traffic levels look like. What we then have is the trigger function. So when you deviate from that, that then instigates a trigger mode. And then a mitigation will take place. 
The problem that service providers have is they have to set those boundaries so wide that any targeted layer 7 attack is very difficult for them to detect because you're not deviating enough from the baseline for them to be able to trigger a mitigation or to be able to detect that mitigation. Okay. So I've just mentioned them very, very briefly. Um, what are the priorities on, on the service provider? It's all uptime stability, minimal disruptions. Um, methods, flow collection, they've got to be network-wide, minimize change. How do they do it today? Well, the majority of service providers today, when a DDoS, in, DDoS attack is detected, will divert that traffic through, through a BGP route injection, force the traffic to a cleaning center. That cleaning center will then pass that traffic through a GRE tunnel back to the destination. Sounds simple, doesn't it? Yeah? Well, if you talk to a service provider and you say, that's what I'm going to do, and I'm going to do it automatically, he'll just die of a heart attack. Because <laughs> he doesn't want you messing with his network at all, let alone injecting BGP routes to redirect traffic through his core network. But of course, they've got to be able to, to clean it somehow. So the challenge that they have is they can't monitor all the data all the time, so they do this sampling. But what they are able to do is remove enough of the bad, bad traffic to basically perform a level of cleaning for you. So, and that's, that's the way the solutions work today. Let's look at what the enterprises are asking for. So they've got critical services, targeted attacks. They can't afford any disruption. Okay? And they have to maintain service. The product is typically in line. It has to give a very detailed picture. They will allow automatic mitigation, because they have to. It's typically hardware assisted. For anything to scale to the size of DDoS attacks that are happening today, it's got some hardware assistance in it. And what they're typically using is heuristic and behavioral. And I'll talk about those in, in a second as well. So, what we'll do is we'll focus a little bit. Unfortunately, it's not that clear, the slide, but I'll try and, uh, I'll try and read them out. There's about 10 different layers here of how you mitigate DDoS today in an inline solution. And all of these are not completely reliant on the other, but they do have a link to them. So, I'll talk about them individually. So, virtual partitioning. In any hosting or enterprise today, he has to have the ability to distinguish between different service levels. In other words, what he has to be able to do is identify a critical service versus a non-critical service. That actually is quite difficult to do from a DDoS detection and mitigation perspective because when you're trying to do that, very often what you'll do is you'll lose detail on the critical services. So he has to have the ability to distinguish between them. The next one is geolocation access lists. Um, I question the value of this if I'm completely honest, but I've been assured by many people, including my peers and, and a number of other people in, in, in our industry, that it is important. In other words, if Russia is attacking Japan, we can block Russia. To me, it's quite sledgehammer. It's, it's quite a, a draconian way of blocking traffic. So, um, and, uh, and the whole point is maintaining service. Well, I've just dosed the whole of China. So it's <laughs> I question the value. I do. But, but it is part of DDoS mitigation, and it's part of a process that we have to go through. The next one, Bogon filtering. Relatively simple. Is it a valid address? You know, whether I'm taking the list from a live list or whether I'm taking the list from an RFC, uh, is it valid data? You know, and this is where we're starting to talk about the different levels now. And what we're actually doing is, if you think in theory, we're stepping up the, 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 the layers of protocol. Because each one is more detailed and more important than the other. So, Bogon filtering, and, and typically, I think it's RFC 1418 or one of them, but it's, it's all, you know, remove all private address space. It shouldn't be on the internet. If it is coming from somewhere, block it. You know, take it out. It's not valid data. Now, the next one is protocol anomaly prevention, and this is actually relatively simple, yeah? But an awful lot of DDoS attacks today still use it. 
So I'm going to set no flags in a TCP header. I'm going to send a packet because I know that it can mess up some hosts. I'm going to use a TCP SYN attack. It's the simplest attack ever. You know, I'm going to try and exhaust resource. Well, firstly, majority of those TCP SYN attacks, even today, are still spoofed. So what the systems will typically do is do what we call a SYN cookie check. So we'll then fire an ACK back at the SYN. If we don't get a response back, we'll, t we'll focus on that, that, pa that IP address and say it's potentially a bad IP address. Yeah. Then what we're talking about is packet flood mitigation. So this is where I'm talking about breaking baselines. Because even these systems today are baseline, baseline systems. Um, if you can imagine it, and it's difficult to explain without graphs, etc. But basically what you have is all of these baselines running continuously and multiple levels of these baselines that are running. So imagine I've got I've got a TCP baseline, I've got a UDP baseline, I've got an ICMP baseline. Um, all of those are running, and they're running at different timed levels as well. So I've got a one-minute baseline, I've got a five-minute baseline, an hourly baseline, daily baseline, weekly baseline, monthly baseline. And what then happens is each one of those has a different weight on the final result. Because it's deviation, and this is where we're talking about behavioral, de behavioral detection here. Because if I deviate from that baseline, I've triggered mitigation. Yeah? And it's not going to block the attack. What it's going to do is put the system into a mode where it actually starts enforcing controls then. Because as far as it's concerned, it's in a mitigation mode and not just a detection mode. Um, stateful inspection. This is something uh, that comes into an awful lot of discussion, especially when people are trying to use what I class as, as older technology, if we're talking about firewalls, IDSs, etc., to do DDoS mitigation. The challenge that you have is those types of devices will have to maintain state, and they have to maintain for every session. And if you actually look at the end of the spectrum, they're, they're doing a completely different job to what we're trying to do with a DDoS mitigation tool. What they're trying to do is restrict traffic and access to services, because that's what they're designed to do. Block all bad traffic. What a DDoS mitigation tool is actually trying to do is completely the opposite. It's maintaining service and access to those services. If you look from conceptually, that's actually completely opposite. And that's the challenge. Because I know if I can throw enough sessions at a firewall or an IDS, I can bring that firewall down. Yeah? Even the biggest firewalls in the world, no disrespect to them, there's lots out there, but they can be brought down. For a DDoS mitigation tool to be able to survive those and not become part of the attack itself, what it actually has to do is very quickly forget about session state. So as soon as it receives the minimum amount of information and literally one or two packets, it's forgotten about it because it can't maintain, maintain an indefinite state table. And we've seen with the, with the volumetrics and the way that we can throw traffic at destinations today, you can't have that. So it has to be able to do that. So layer three, layer four filtering. There are certain things that you're going to want to restrict that aren't allowed. And the same way a firewall will do it, the same way other devices will do it, you can actually set in the box or in these solutions the ability to block certain ports, to block certain traffic, because you know it shouldn't be allowed through. And it's, it's one of the simplest ones that we have. Application layer filtering. Uh, everybody talks about WAF. Everybody talks about uh, the ability to understand vulnerabilities in a host and then ensure that that vulnerability isn't exploited. Well, we, you have to have that ability in these DDoS solutions today. It doesn't necessarily need to know about every destination, but it has to be able to understand how those exploits, how those vulnerabilities are exploited and what the behavior of the exploit is. Yeah? So if you see an attack incoming that performs a certain sequence of events, it's not signature-based. You're not relying on the packet. You're relying on the behavior. So it's the sequence of events that occur 
not the data within the packet. Because everybody will talk about uh, a good, good ex-colleague of mine, a guy called Jose Nazario, really bright guy, and he wrote a book on polymorphic worms. He's now writing a book on polymorphic DDoS. So a DDoS attack that will change itself and adapt itself to protection. So if it fails in one way, it'll adapt. If it carries on failing, it'll carry on adapting. If you think about signature-based systems, that's a huge downfall for them. And this is where DDoS is going. We know it is. Um, and therefore, the only way that we believe in the industry is through these behavioral and heuristic analysis. Okay. Finally, we've got algorithmic and heuristic, heuristic analysis. And, and these are really the last levels of intelligence, the highest level of intelligence. So I'm looking at how somebody behaved yesterday versus how they're behaving today and what's going to happen um, in that attack mode and in that attack event. So um, I put this slide up because I think it's quite relevant. Um, and looking at the way people try and use existing solutions today to mitigate DDoS. People do use firewalls. They do have some, de, you know, some DDoS defense mechanisms. But as we've said, you know, oh, they, they've got st stateful inspection. Well, stateful inspection isn't a good thing in DDoS. <laughs> it's actually a very bad thing. Um, but they are, they are being used. Looking at switches, they can rate limit. The challenge that you have with rate limit, again, it's this sledgehammer to crack a nut. I'm using a far stronger mechanism than I need, and I'm actually blocking good traffic potentially. Now, everybody will say, and there's an argument, oh, but TCP retransmissions, it'll cover, it'll recover the session, et cetera, et cetera. It doesn't always. And if you actually look at what is important to enterprise today, it's about maintaining that service. And if I can't maintain the service, I'm not doing my job. Routers, they do certain parts of it as well. Routers are often the first thing that fails in a DDoS attack because just packet throughput, they just can't cope with it. And, uh, and even the service providers today, that, you know, going back to what I said earlier, what were the two things service providers first protected in their networks? Their infrastructure and DNS. That was, a, that was exactly what they focused on. IPSs, um, I can see some of the relevance in it, in it as a, from an intelligence perspective, but again, going back to what are these solutions designed to do? They're actually designed to stop access, not enable service. Very, very different. And then host-based IPSs. I actually rub these out because I don't believe they do any of it. <laughs> At the end of the day, um, they've got very little to do with a DDoS attack that's this huge, and then about, they've got about this much power. So anyway. So... Um, Changing landscape, um, let's look at the way DDoS attacks have occurred. They have been large. They've focused on vulnerabilities, in other words, infrastructure and things like DNS. It's had limited mitigation. Spoofing has been commonplace, but we know how to get around that now. Um, slow responses and this human innovation, this human latency. What are customers actually asking for today and what are enterprises deploying out there today? They understand that the only way that they can really protect themselves against either zero-day threats or emerging threats is through behavioral analysis of the, of the traffic. They do have to detect small targeted attacks. They can't just focus on these volumetric ones because the layer seven attacks that are occurring today will take out servers and will take out services. Hardware assisted, automatic mitigation. They are trusting more and more um, the solutions that are out there today because they're so configurable and flexible. You know, when I'm, an a when I'm able to put certain classes of server into one group and have a high level of protection and a very low against the rest, it relieves them a lot. It takes away an awful lot of their worries that either we're going to miss a DOS attack or, more importantly, we're going to think there's a DOS attack when there isn't one, a false positive, and start blocking traffic, and that's what the, 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 they've got to a point where they're a lot more acceptable of that. And they've definitely got to remove the threat to the service. So they have to maintain um, business critical services. That's the that's their goal. 
That's what they're trying to achieve, uh, despite all the challenges that they've got and all the problems. Um, I make one point, and I'll, I'm conscious of time. Business reputation is paramount. In the business report that I showed you earlier, when they said, you know, what are they most worried about? First and foremost, it was their reputation. You know, for online banking, for online gambling, online gaming services, it's all about their reputation. So that's me. Um, pretty much on time. Good. All right. Well, thank you very much, and um, I hope it was of use. Thank you. Thank you.